Thank you very much for the introduction and for yeah, the organize, for organizing this splendid uh, workshop and uh, conference. Um, yeah, it's it's actually not so easy to be after chats because I I really will change from programmability to to what entropy can do, uh, but I ho still hope that I can show you some surprises uh, what you can achieve with entropy alone. Uh, and so what I actually want to do is, is, is a sort of a mix of what's the status now from a com uh, computer simulation perspective and what's next, because that was sort of the, uh, uh, what was asked me. And so over the past two decades, we have seen that yeah, we have seen big strides in the synthesis of all kinds of nanoparticles and colloidal particles. They can change in sizes from the nanometers uh, range to the micrometer range. I'm actually coming from the micrometer range where color science is, is well understood. Uh, but we are now moving also to smaller particles. And these particles can be made from any materials uh, and uh, with many different shapes. And one can even tune the interactions in all kinds of ways. And often you can just tune the interaction in such a way that the van der Waals interactions are completely masked, such that only the shape of these particles uh, matters. So you often can describe these particles with just only excluded volume interactions. And so if you take the simplest uh, shape, which is, yeah, for some uh, think the spheres are the simplest shape, then already the earliest computer simulations in 1957 has already shown that there's a spontaneous crystallization from a disordered fluid phase towards a phase center cubic crystal phase, just purely driven by entropy alone. And it took 30 years before uh, the colloid synthesis was accurate enough that they could make monodispersed spheres and could show this freezing transition in just beam and maze spheres. And then later on, many other colloidal crystals were formed, uh, uh, for instance, from silica spheres, cobalt nanocrystal, semiconductor particles, and so on. One can increase the structural diversity of these uh, uh, structures by just playing with two size ratios, for instance, uh, with the size ratio, uh, by, for instance, mixing big spheres together with small spheres, and then you can get already many different exotic crystal structures. There's this AB13 crystal structure, which is a very exotic one, and then the AB2 crystal structure, and this is for a size ratio of about a half. So the small spheres are half the diameter in size as the big ones. One can also go to more similar sizes uh, for a size ratio of about 0.8, and then the so-called lava phases appear in the phase diagram. And so this is work by Chris Murray for lead selenide particles. They found magnesium zinc and magnesium nickel at two phases. There are actually three types of lava phases. They are called or named after Fritz Lavas. There's the magnesium copper two phase. And these lava phases are built up of dimers of big spheres. And these dimers of big spheres form a hexagonal letters and they can be stacked in different ways. So for the magnesium copper two phase, it's ABC, ABC stacked. If you have an AB, AB stick stacking, there is a magnesium zinc two phase. If it is AB, AC stacked, then it's the magnesium nickel two phase. If you do the free energy calculation for hard spheres on those parts, on those structures, you will find that the magnesium zinc two phase is the most stable phase. But actually, the magnesium copper two phase is more interesting because of photonic uh, uh, properties. So the magnesium copper two phase consists of a diamond of big spheres and the pyrochloral letters of small spheres. If you can self assemble such a magnesium copper two phase using different species for the, uh, using different materials for the two species, you can easily burn away one of the species uh, or, uh, such that you end up with either a diamond letters or a pyrochloral letters and both these letters are uh, do exhibit a photonic band that stretch. And so there's a huge effort now to make these, to self-assemble these magnesium copper two phases. Um, so if we can even diverse this, uh, this, uh, the structures by uh, playing with shape, here's uh, uh, early work by the Torquato group, also Escobedo, Fernando Escobedo work on, on the, uh, predicting the self-assembled structures. Uh, Michael Engel and Sharon Glotzer worked on, on uh, all the self-assembled structures. 
uh, Michael Grunwald, also uh, Victor Cooper, worked on this, those and uh, compared them with experiments, and we uh, basically uh, studied all the dentists back in. And it's very nice that most of these people are just present in this uh, workshop here. And so we, we were really interested in, in getting the dentist back of all these uh, polyhedral shaped particles. So we developed a uh, crystal structure predicting uh, algorithm, uh, which basically is just simulate, uh, simulating the unit cell within a floppy box such that you can scan over many different crystal structures at the same time. And so by just a gradual increase in the pressure, you can get a tensor specking structure. If you decrease the temperatures in steps, you can get the ground state structures. Here we are just playing with the hard particle system, so we gradually increase the pressure to infinite pressure. And so we did that for many different particle shapes, the platonic solids, the Armenian solids, the Catalan solids, John solids, the regular crescent, empty crescent, and then several non-convex bodies, including the Stanford bunny that consists of uh, many triangles, thousands of triangles, uh, just as a proof of principle that it can get the tensor uh, specking of all of these. I want to focus on one particular shape, and that's the truncated tetrahedron, and you will see later on in this talk why. Uh, these truncated tetrahedron form dimers. Uh, this is a central symmetric object. They form a brave lattice, and uh, it was published on the cover of physical review letters. And Salvatore Clayton showed that the packing that these truncated tetrahedra nearly fills all of space. We have 207 over 208, so 99.5% of the space is filled by this truncated tetrahedra. And this was uh, on the cover of JCP. So also the Glotzer group looked at these truncated tetrahedra. They uh, mapped out the phase diagram as a function of tr uh, truncation. They are very exotic crystal structure, all driven by uh, entropy alone. So if you predict all these candidate crystal structures or all these, can and these denser speckings, you can just run equation of state, you can calculate the equation of state, you can calculate the free energies, you can then uh, perform common tension constructions on those uh, free energy curves, and then you can map out the phase diagram. And we did that for many different particle shapes, and we reviewed that in this uh, paper here. So we did, for instance, uh, often the phase diagrams are plotted as a function of a shape parameter in such a way that you can go from cubes via cubactahedra to octahedra, and then along the y-axis is the uh, packing fraction, which is the, the only control parameter in these hard particle systems. Yeah? Um, I don't know where it is now. So these are the cubes uh, going to cubectahedra to octahedra. We also looked at the phase diagram of cubes. There are many delocalized uh, vacancies, triangles. We went from tetrahedra uh, to rounded tetrahedra to spheres. Also cubes that can be made rounder uh, via spheres to octahedra, but also platelets and, uh, uh, as a function of plate uh, thickness. Uh, so this is actually the status what we can do. Uh, there's a huge variety of colloidal building blocks that, uh, that are available to us now. They can be self-assembled into nanostructured materials, and we have very efficient algorithms to predict the self-assembled structures and the dense packings. We can then map out the uh, phase diagrams, uh, but what can we actually do more? Uh, so what we are uh, doing now is, is to use machine learning potentials. If we have more complex colloidal building blocks, and because uh, there's really, uh, shape is really an infinite parameter, uh, also the thermodynamic state state point is an infinite uh, uh, parameter, we also are working on inverse design methods to really speed up the, the yeah, and uh, scan off all the possible uh, combinations. So we started recently to also look at these lichen stabilized particles in the DNA coated uh, nanoparts. We just used the, the, the model that Michael Grunwald uh, introduced. So we used a Martini force field to model these, uh, these lichens, and we uh, just 
yeah, RIN simulations. Uh, we also looked at uh, DNA corticoids. Here we uh, got our inspiration from Alex and Monica. And what is very nice nowadays is that you can just put all these particles in a simulation box and you can just let them self-assemble without having to put the particles at um, yeah, a well-educated test for the letter structure. So they really self-assemble in simple cubic plastic PCT uh, structures in disordered, uh, compositional disordered uh, plastic BCT structures without yeah, making an educated test for the letter structure. So these simulations are still extremely slow. We, we can look at the self-assembly in a simulation box, but it's uh, extremely uh, slow. And so that's also the reason why we work, are working on yeah, ways to coarse grain these systems. So we have these uh, fine-grained models with all the lichens on top of the particles. Uh, they are characterized by the spatial coordinates for all these atoms. So if there are n uh, big n nanoparticles, consists of nb atoms, we have uh, small n uh, coordinates. So the uh, probability to find the certain configuration is given by the Boltzmann weight. Uh, and we actually like to map that onto a coarse grain system where we have only n coarse grain sites. And so there's uh, big n spatial coordinates with uh, a probability to find a coarse grain configuration given by the Boltzmann weight. And this is the so-called potential of mean force, the many body potential of mean force that depends on all the coordinates of these coarse grain sites. And by just equating this with the probability that you find a certain uh, coarse grain configuration in a fine grain system, which we can do by using these uh, delta functions, we can uh, derive yeah, the many body uh, coarse grain potential, which is actually the log of a constraint partition function. So it's a constraint partition function because we fix the uh, coordinates, this uh, coarse grain coordinates using these delta functions here. So we can then also take derivatives of this many body potential of mean force uh, with respect to one of the coarse grain uh, sites. We can measure these forces using the fine grain uh, system. If we then fit this uh, many body potential of mean force with yeah, a linear set of Taylor Parinello symmetry things, we can immediately get also the many body potentials with uh, mean force without an explicit thermodynamic integration. So this is a very nice way to yeah, only measure the forces in a fine-grained system, but then at the same time getting the yeah, free energy reserves or the many body potential of mean force of the system. And this works very well. Here we uh, this uh, coarse grain many body potential of mean force, we can just use in Monte Carlo simulation, we can use friend simulations, and we can compare it with molecular dynamics of the fine grain system. And we find that the structure is very well captured, but also the uh, phase behavior. And so we are extending it now also to many other systems, charge colloids, where we integrate out all the core and counter lines, also elongated particles. We can do it for uh, particles with a surface pattern, uh, which gives rise to a very complicated uh, potential energy surface. But using machine learning, you can just fit all those uh, potential energy surfaces, which are extremely complicated. We can also do it for anisotropic particles, where we add uh, polymer as a depletant. And also here, we really find that, the, uh, that this machine learning potential depends then on all the coordinates of the particles but also all the orientations of the particles. So we had to extend the way that we fit all these uh, machine learning potentials that also takes into account the orientations of the particles. So then the inverse design uh, techniques, uh, yeah, usually you start with a certain particle shape, particle interaction, and then a film and dynamic state point. You then perform an experiment or a simulation, and then you just look what comes out, what kind of structure or what kind of property. And this is an extremely slow process. So if your uh, experimental colleagues tell you that they've changed this uh, synthesis, then you really have to go all over again. And so it would be much nicer if you can start with a certain structure that you want, a certain property, and then derive back what is the shape, interaction, and film and dynamic staple that you need to get that structure. And so I will uh, briefly show how we do that. Uh, I gave a longer talk uh, last week. Uh, so you can watch back if you are interested, or you can ask me directly uh, during the breaks. 
So we use an uh, order parameter that uh, can discriminate the different phases uh, by taking the diffraction patterns and then we feed it into a convolution neural network that tells us in the end what the probability is that it belongs to one of these phases. Uh, and so we train this convolution neural network just by uh, running simulation of, the, uh, of these uh, six different phases. Uh, we exactly know what these phases are. We can run dog simulations for those. We can uh, then calculate the diffraction pattern and we can train this convolution neural network on those training sets. And then in the end, if we train it, we find that the uh, neural network can classify all these phases with 100%. And because we get a probability that it belongs to one of these phases, we can use it as a fitness function for an evolution strategy. And so this is what we do here. We uh, start with a, a simple system that gives you a quasi-crystal in the pressure temperature plane. We use an uh, evolution strategy, uh, which means that we start with a Gaussian distribution somewhere in the fluid phase. And we take then uh, n combinations of pressure temperature from this Gaussian distribution. We then run simulations for those n different combinations. And we then take the diffraction patterns and then feed it in, into the neural network. And that gives us probability that it belongs to the uh, quasi-crystal phase. And so we then update the goals in distribution in such a way that it goes into the direction where the probability of, the, of finding the quasi-crystal becomes bigger. So the probability first is extremely low. It's 10 to the minus 6. We are deep in the fluid phase. But then within 10 generations, it really goes to 1, where we really hit the quasi-crystal regime. And this works yeah, very well for yeah, many different crystal structures, quasi crystals, but also in, in the case of, for instance, liquid crystals. Uh, so the next step that we wanted to do is, is actually hierarchical self assembly. So we start with just colloidal particles, we disperse it in solvent, we exploit the Brownian motion, and then we uh, crisp, uh, uh, make, uh, for instance, a crystal of these nanocrystals or superlattice of these nanocrystals. But can we also uh, perform a uh, self-assembly step further? So can we uh, take this to the next level? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, we can. We can uh, perform this self-assembly also in the spherical confinements of an emulsion droplet. And then by evaporating the solvent, we can make a supraparticle of those. And so uh, we can then take all these supraparticles and then perform an other self-assembly step and then make a crystal of all these uh, supraparts or a crystal of crystals of all these nanocrystals. And so this is sort of a new common theme in our group. If something looks very nice, a nice particle shape or a nice structure, just put it in a sphere and make a supraparticle. And so the idea behind this is, is that with every self-assembly step, uh, step, you can basically add new functionalities so you can make a hierarchical structure with many different functionalities. And so this is uh, work that we did many, many years ago, 2050. We started with uh, the big colloids, micron-sized particle. This is an emulsion droplet. You can clearly see the brown emulsion. And then by evaporating the solvent, you can make a, so, uh, a superparticle. We also did for cobalt iron oxide particles. Uh, we used a very poorly dispersed emulsion. So you can get many different number of particles in these emulsion droplets. And if you dry all these supraparticles, you can an analyze them. And what we see is very beautiful icosino clusters for yeah, up to 1,000 particles in an uh, emulsion droplet. 10,000 particles, we find a very beautiful rhombicosidodehedral cluster. And if you, if you go towards a million particles, you just get a FCC domain. So these icosahedral clusters consist of these tetrahedral domains, FCC domains. There are 20 of them. If you pack 20 of them uh, together, you get an icosahedral cluster. Uh, they all point inwards. Uh, they meet uh, at the center with one of their vertices. And then the outside, you get these one-on-one -on -one planes. And then there are these uh, 12 of these uh, five-fold symmetry points. And then there are these edges and then twinning planes uh, where the uh, tetrahedral domains meet each other. If the system becomes bigger, then it forms an, another HCP plane. It forms another FCC domain on top of this 
uh, tetrahedral domain, and it fills then all these batches as well. And it looks then as follows from the outside. So there's this fivefold ring, uh, the 10 facet, and then the 111 facets. And so you can uh, really self assemble into, a, for instance, a hexagonal layer. This is work by Michael Engel and Nikki Fogel, where you really see all these very beautiful Rhombicosa decahedral clusters. Uh, so we also looked at the crystallization mechanism. You see already very strong layering of the particles near the boundary. It tries to form all these wedges inwards, uh, starting from the outside. If the wedges are too big, it melts again. If they are too small, it grows further. And in the end, you get just a very beautiful icosahedral cluster. And so this is all driven by entropy alone. So can we also do it for, for instance, a binary heart mix, uh, sphere mixture? So big spheres, small spheres mixed together in a spherical confinement. It should maximize the entropy. And so what kind of structures can we get? And what we, uh, so this is uh, work uh, together with the experiments. They use lead selenide and cadmium selenide particles. In bulk, it gives you the magnesium zinc uh, tool phase because that is a, a filament dynamic stable structure. But if we put it in a spherical confinement, we again see these very beautiful five-fold symmetries at the outside of the uh, supra particles. And if you perform the simulations, it now starts to crystallize at the off-centered location in a spherical confinement, so not at the boundary, and it grows then all these wedges uh, by growing it outwards. What is very surprising is, is if you analyze these wedges, is that it is not the magnesium zinc phase, but it's now the magnesium copper tool phase. And so to understand that why it changes from magnesium zinc to magnesium copper, you have to go back to the subunit of the lava phase. It is actually a truncated tetrahedron. There's a big sphere in the center of this truncated tetrahedron. And then on all the uh, edges, uh, vertices, there are 12 of these small spheres uh, located. Uh, and you can easily put them together. So we 3D printed all these te uh, truncated tetrahedra. You get these five-fold uh, symmetries, or you can take 20 of them and make a so-called Bergman cluster or an icosahedral cluster. Um, these truncated tetrahedra, and we already saw it on all these coffers, uh, they really like to form dimers. These, these are also called the free half polyhedra, uh, and it's also shown by Sharon Glotzer. Uh, if we make these uh, magnesium copper or these lava phases using these uh, free half polyhedra, you will see that for the magnesium copper two phase, it's a nice straight uh, line. But in the case of magnesium zinc two and magnesium nickel two, you get these zigzag structures. And so indeed, if you want to make these Bergman clusters bigger uh, from just a simple truncated tetrahedral to bigger truncated tetrahedral, you can only do that with magnesium copper two. And so that's the reason why it changes from magnesium zinc to this magnesium uh, copper two phases. So we can also analyze these uh, structures. So we uh, looked at the simulated clusters, but also the experimental clusters. For the experimental clusters, we really did the tracking of all these uh, nanoparticles using uh, electron microscopy. And we really find very good agreement between simulations and experiments. So we can just go back to the center of such a cluster. It starts with a single small sphere that is really in the center. And then we can look how good or what kind of layers we find around these particles. So we then find 12 small particles surrounded by the central particle. Then there are 20 big ones around it. Uh, there is 12 small ones in the icosahedral structure. There are 60 small ones in a truncated icosahedral structure. So this is the Bergman cluster or the, just a simple football. Uh, we can even go now further. We find 20 big ones in a dodecahedral structure, uh, 12 small ones in an icosahedral structure, and then uh, 30 small ones in an icosahedral structure, and then 60 big ones in a rhombicosahedral arrangement. And so this is really all by entropy alone. I really find this amazing that yeah, every particle, big one, small one, really knows where it has to sit. We can now also zoom in into one of these five-fold symmetry centers. Uh, we can really go uh, from the outside towards the center. 
and then we see all these pentagonal uh, uh, five-fold symmetric, uh, symmetric tubes that really goes towards the Bergman cluster in the uh, middle, in the center, uh, which spans up basically these magnesium copper tool wedges. And we find them both in experiments and simulation, and you really see that they are alternating um, between big spheres and small spheres, big spheres, small spheres, etc. And all by entropy alone. So what's the status now? We can really do hierarchical self-assembly using the self-assembly of colonial particles. We are doing it with spheres, but also binary spheres, plates, rolls, cubes, whatever you really like to put in an emulsion droplet, we can just put it there and then look at all the structures. Uh, so what's next? Yeah, what we actually, so all these structures are really passive. They are just static, rigid. Uh, we really like to go towards yeah, colonial machines and uh, uh, materials that can have dynamical uh, transitions uh, that we can activate with external stimuli. And I will show you uh, that we found a system that has a bi-stable state. Uh, we actually stumbled upon that uh, by accident. And uh, yeah, very preliminary results how we want to go towards yeah, colloidal robots or colloidal uh, mechanical metamaterials. So this, uh, how we stumbled upon these bistable states, it started actually with, yeah, what is the best taking of cannonballs? We uh, went back to the question. Uh, this was the uh, question that was asked by Sir Walter Rayleigh, a British sailor, to Kepler, uh, because he wanted to stack the cannonball on the ship. And Kepler conjectured that, yeah, stacking hexagonal plane in a pyramid uh, packing gives you the best packing. But this is actually only true if you consider an infinite packing or a periodic packing. If you consider, for instance, a finite packing, which you have on decks of ships, uh, then if, if you wrap it in their convex hell, it's not always a compact cluster that uh, gives you the best packed packing. And this is a, a problem that really mathematicians love. They showed, for instance, that if you have five dimensions or a higher dimensional space, the sausage is always the best packed structure. So when you have a linear arrangement of all these spheres, uh, and in four dimensions, the sausage is always the best packed structure uh, for up to a very big number. You can also see it, uh, and so because there's a, this a very big number, they also call it the sausage catastrophe. In the three dimensional space, uh, the sausage is the best back structure up to 55, uh, 57, 58, 63, 64. And the cluster, the compact cluster, is the best back structure for all these numbers. But they never could really figure out what cluster optimizes the packing. So this really intrigued us. Uh, we looked at this. This is the 55 that backs, uh, uh, the best packing for the 55 cluster. And then by just really we uh, very quickly realized that just small crystallized beds um, gives you the best packing. And so we started cutting tetrahedral clusters and octahedral clusters and bipyramid clusters uh, from the vertices and from the planes. And we found the 56, the 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, they all uh, pack better than the sausage arrangement. So it really goes from a very linear uh, arrangement to a compact cluster to a linear arrangement, and then all these clusters, another 63, and then for the rest, all the compact clusters become more stable. So we also, so indeed, if you look at uh, old pictures, you sometimes see these sausages at decks of ships. So we also ask ourselves, can we make an experimental system? This is work with uh, Rao Futukuri. He was able to make giant unilemmer uh, vesicles, put polystyrene or silica spheres in it, and we looked at these uh, different conformations. And by just changing the osmotic pressure on these vesicles, you can go from, uh, from compact clusters to plate-like clusters to linear clusters. And we also did the simulations for this, and we could go up to uh, nine particles. Uh, you can, in principle, put more particles in it, but then the sausage uh, doesn't become stable. So they just break both in simulation and in experiments. And so we mapped out the phase diagram. Uh, this is the volume of vesicle uh, normalized in a proper way. Uh, and here are the number of particles in the vesicle. 
and we indeed find that the linear uh, arrangement picks the best, so it has the lowest volume. But in between, uh, around these transition points, we really find bistable state where it can go from plate-like cluster to, clus uh, to cluster, clusters or plate-like uh, arrangement to linear arrangements. And we find those both in experiments and in simulators. So this reminded me of what David Limmer showed uh, the first day, where he needed to shear uh, to really make it, uh, to get trans transformations from one cluster to the other cluster. Here it's uh, just yeah, due to the uh, coupling of the fluctuations of the membrane and the Brownian motion of the particles. Um, so we also really like to make colloidal constructs that we can make, uh, yeah, for instance, colloidal uh, mechanical metamaterials or colloidal robots. We can make colloidal molecules. This is already 2003. But all these colloidal molecules are really rigid. And if you want to make a robot or a mechanical metamaterial, you actually like to have flexible bonds and you like to have control of the valencies. So one way to have control of the valency is, is to uh, play with shape. So we use opposite, uh, positively charged hematized cubes together with negatively charged silica uh, particles. We can change the size ratio and then we can have control of the valency. So you can have six uh, spheres on top of a cube or you can have two spheres on top of a cube and you can also change the number of uh, spheres. So, and this is work by Daniela Kraft, uh, who did the experiment. But still, in this case, the bonds are fixed and rigid. But now we are also combining it with a lipid uh, bilayer around the particles. We can stick DNA on, in these lipid bilayers. And then, yeah, we basically did a theory on those. We can calculate the free energy landscape of a sphere on top of such a cube. And we find that we can go from unconfined motion to confined motion. So does this work also in experiments? Uh, here we have the experiments. Uh, they can really change the valencies, the number of uh, spheres on top of the cube. Here we did the simulation. We can uh, follow the trajectories on the cube. And indeed, also in the experiments, they can go by increasing the size ratio between the cubes and the spheres. You can go from unconstrained motion towards constrained motion. If the spheres are too big, uh, they don't move off the surface. You can also play, because it's DNA, you can uh, play with the temperature. This is at very low temperatures. The, uh, the spheres are just fixed. They, they can only wiggle on the faces. Now we are heating the sample, and then the uh, spheres can move off the surface of the cube. So this is really the beginning of yeah, making colloidal robots and mechanical metamaterials. So I quickly like to acknowledge all the people, Alphons van Bladen, Bart de Nijs, Daarwang, Enos van der Wey did all the supra particle work. These are the people that all did the simulation and uh, some of them were co-supervised by Laura Fillion and Pinnea van Roy. Uh, we teamed up with Sarah Bals for the electron microscopy, Chris Murray for the particle synthesis, Daniela Kraft did all the DNA work, the colloidal robots, and Rao for the theory did the vesicles. Um, I will just leave up this. This is sort of the wrap up, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, questions. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. So um, I have two questions. So the first one is um, neither of your machine learned and thermodynamic uh, coarse grain force field um, consider kinetics. So do you think that the, it would also give you accurate nucleation pathways? And the second question is that um, I saw that your CNN uh, classifier, they seem to be like trained unsupervisedly, unsuper, uh, so have you been aware of any unsupervised technique that can also like classify causal crystal? So two questions. So the first question was uh, if it worked for nucleation. Yeah, often we assume uh, quasi equilibrium for nucleation. So in, in that sense, it, it should work. Uh, so this is, 
so it's thermodynamic uh, consistent, so we really integrate it out uh, in the partition function. So if it, it works, if you consider uh, equilibrium. So if the, the interaction potential changes over time, so if, if you can't assume equilibrium, then we have to go to different ways, yeah. Okay, so the kinetics would be wrong. Is, the, the, is that what you mean? Like it, it, yeah, if you can assume always quasi equilibrium, it would be correct. But it, it, it depends on yeah, the, the time scales in your nucleation and the interaction potential, how fast do they equilibrate. Okay. Okay. Um, the yeah, second question. Yeah, so, so the, your, your CNN model, the classifier, it's, it's trained supervisory, right? If yeah, I understand the, correctly. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I, I'm asking that, uh, have you been aware of any unsupervised model or technique for we, classifying? We do crystal? both. Uh, here, we, because we know all the phases and we start with uh, deflection patterns from those known phases, we just use a supervised way. But okay. if you don't know what's, what's in your simulation box, you can, we can also do it uh, in an unsupervised way. So okay. we use also, we often start very simply with uh, a simple principle component analysis, but you can make it more complicated, uh, for instance, with a convolution, uh, um, I now forgot the word, <laughs> an auto encoder. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, but well, we do actually, both, well, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, does the class, the behavior, the, uh, uh, does the performance of the classifier also depends on the quality of the picture? I'm just curious. Yeah, so it's always uh, with machine learning, you always have to put things in. So the, I think uh, it also, it still asks us to think what you put in and what you get out. Uh, and then, yeah, if you don't put it in, you never get it out. So you, we always think very hard, what descriptors do we put in? Okay. Uh, do we use bond order parameters or other symmetry functions or uh, other descriptors? Uh, if you really don't put it in, you never get it out. So it's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the nice overview. Uh, could you just elaborate a bit more on the inverse design of the quasi-crystal? I didn't get what are the parameters that you optimize and how do you search the design space exactly? Um, so let me go back. Yeah, Oop. I went very fast because I gave this talk yeah, a week ago. Uh, we optimize both the interaction potentials, uh, and in, in this case, we, we use the square shoulder potential where we could change the width and yeah, basically the temperature and the pressure. So it's both interaction, um, uh, interaction parameters plus the thermodynamic state point that we optimized here. And so here we only did pressure and temperature, uh, but we can also change the shoulder width, for instance, and use it as a uh, design parameter. So it really depends on, on the system that we looked at. And we are now also extending it to other systems. Okay, and the so search is so gradient descent, or is it something more fancy? It's using an evolution strategy. Um, I think in this case, we also looked in the end uh, on, let's say, the fitness landscape. And I think we could get away with just a simple uh, gradient descent in this case. Um, but yeah, here we use an evolution strategy. You can also use a um, Bayesian optimization, but we found that actually too, too random. So you really have to explore with patient optimization the whole phase space. Also, also enriches, here we know that we want to move to, towards higher pressure, you need uh, more density, or higher uh, more structure in the system, so it then immediately goes to higher pressures. But with patient optimization, it, it also lets you explore enriches where you are actually not interested in. Thank you. Um, I'm intrigued by um, um, 
your use of CNN for, um, for, for these inverse problems, going from structures to shapes and interactions. Um, how robust in general do you think that is if the system has a lot of degeneracy in it so that you know, multiple shapes can get to the same structure? Um, yeah, the reason why we use uh, uh, the diffraction pattern here is, is that that's a way to, to recognize quasi crystals uh, because it, it uh, shows sharp red peaks, but then we have a rotation symmetry that's for better for crystals. Uh, we could have also used other other parameter fitness functions. It, it's not always the case that the, the fraction pattern is the best one. So if there are many competing phases and you really can't, yeah, I, I think in principle you should be able to see it in the fraction patterns. Um, but sometimes it, it's better to use a different other parameter fitness function. Yeah. Uh, very beautiful work. Uh... So uh, my question is on the coarse graining method. Um, so for the nanoparticles you know, with ligands, right? There's usually a question as to whether these force fields are transferable, right? In this case, um, uh, transferability in terms of temperature changes may be of interest, which would be somewhat analogous to changing, say, the quality of the solvent, where I'm uh, imagining that if the temperature is very low or you have a poorer solvent, then the spherical symmetry of the corona may change. So you may have these deformations that Alex was uh, talking about. So I was wondering to what extent this method could be applied to that kind of uh, situation. Um, can I go back? So you always have to check um, if, if you really want to go towards outside your training set, you always have to check whether it's valid or not. Uh, so here we uh, it, it goes correct for a very long time if, if you take all the typical configurations that you see in your new data. Um, here, if, if there are really temperature changes in the liquid conformations, it can go wrong. So you always have them to validate what, what you, if you want to transfer it out. So for another system, we really looked at transferability and we really could push it in two directions which are far from your training data. Here we only looked, yeah, most of the phases, the phase diagram for the system is extremely boring. There's a fluid phase and an FCC phase and nothing else. And yeah, for this whole range, we were able to capture the, the phase behavior. Um, if there are really confirmation of changes on the particles, I think you have to Thank be you. careful. Yeah. So. I have a question about the the Berman cluster. Um, if you can go to that transparency, um, because I mean this is actually when you start putting the layers, this is the sequence of layers that you get uh, on the three three five polytope. Yeah. So there is one where you keep putting them one by one the layers. Uh, you know which transparency, the different shells. Yeah. So. Um, first of all, in which in which context this? Yeah, that one. So this is you were modeling which situation you were modeling here because I couldn't get that one. So this is just analyzing one of these clusters here. So we put big spheres, small spheres together in a spherical confinement. Okay. Let it turn, and then uh, this was just analyzing what structure came out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, the, the, okay. So then. Um, so, so oh, I see. Okay, and then the, the, the thing is here, um, it's also, I guess, very important the ratio of the big and small. Yeah. No. Yeah, uh, that's something we still don't fully understand uh, because we get conflicting results from experiments and simulations. Uh, it is not trivial because um, it. it it really depends indeed on the composition, but also on the vetting of the of one of the species with the surroundings. And so I think in the experiments they find something different and so, different vetting behavior of the small and the big ones, which really changes the structure. So you can play uh, with indeed a composition. If you play with the composition, you can also go to a single domain magnesium zinc phase without having this yeah, five-fold structure. 
We have one last question while the next speaker set up. Is that me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up to Fernando's question. So there's all these inverse design methods that many of us have tried over the past, like iterative Boltzmann, multi-state iterative Boltzmann, or just even taking a structure, calculating the pair correlation function, taking the log, blah, 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 getting out a potential mean force, and then using that as a pair potential in an MD simulation. And from what I can tell, for all these situations, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't to give you back the crystal structure that you started with. And when it doesn't work, it's because there are that same pair potential can support the self-assembly of multiple competing polymorphs. And I wonder, do you see the same sort of thing from your machine-learned models? For the inverse design, I think the way our inverse design works is that we also take into account the state point. Well, if you just measure GFRs and then try to invert it, you don't take into account the state point. So we really also optimize the state points. So we can immediately compare it with the competing structures that we find in the way. And so that's, I think, the strength of our inverse design methods. Okay, thanks. Yeah, let's move on to the next talk. Thank you.